I'm going to go ahead and talk about the immune system today, which is an excellent and timely topic. There are two aspects of the immune system. One is innate immunity, which essentially means your body reacts to something that comes into it. It knows it doesn't belong there, but it doesn't know anything specific about what it is and just does its absolute best to find it. And then specific immunity, which is where your body is able to make something to attack a very specific type of invader. Both of these work in some very similar ways. So let's discuss the similarities between them. Both of them rely upon the idea that your immune system knows things don't belong. So if you have some kind of bug entering your immune system, what it has on it are little receptors that point it out as foreign. And those receptors are antigens. So an antigen is the little thing on the outside of the cell that says, hey, I don't belong here. Or at least it says what it's sort of what it is. And that's what tells your body doesn't belong here. It's like, hey, these antigens don't belong here in my body. And that sets off an entire process of cells going after it that decide it shouldn't be there. All right, so we're going to start specifically with innate immunity, which is the first thing that happens when something new enters the body. So let's say some funny little thing decided to enter your body. Maybe it's a virus, like for example, a flu virus. So the flu virus comes in and it has around it the antigens that tell the body that it doesn't belong. So that's our flu virus. Well, what happens next? First, your body detects it as a generalized invader and it's going to try to stop it. Fortunately, your body has a lot of barriers that can pretty much help to stop different things. So barriers are the first way your body tries to stop stuff. Your skin is your biggest and most major barrier as long as it is not broken in any way. So skin keeps most stuff out of your body. However, we do need to let things in and out. So we've got a whole bunch of other openings other than just the skin. So let's start with the openings that you can see when people are fully closed. They include the mouth, eyes, nose, and ears. So those are all important openings. So those are the barriers. And how do they help to keep things out? Well, your mouth obviously opens and shuts, but it also has in it mucous membranes where things can get stuck, and it has saliva that is actually somewhat antiviral, antimicrobial a little bit, so it can help to kill things. Your eyes have tears, which help try to push things out and keep things from getting in. Your nose has mucus and mucous membranes. It also has little nose hairs, sometimes more than little, which can help catch things and keep them out. And your ears have earwax, which is a key component of catching and trying to stop things from getting in. I know, for instance, when I'm catching a cold, my ears start to get plugged up because my earwax is doing its job. There are other openings in areas that you cannot see while people are clothed. These include the anus, the opening to the digestive system in the intestines, the urethra, the opening to the urinary system, and in women, the vagina, which is a third one. Men only have two, women have three. Both the anus and the urethra, and actually the vagina as well, have mucous membranes, which also catch things and keep stuff from getting in. The vagina also has an extra system in which it are, are certain bacteria that grow around it. Many of them are similar to lactobacillus, and they produce acid. Acid helps to kill stuff and therefore keeping things, specifically fungi, out of the vagina. Lactobacillus, by the way, might be familiar to you. If you look at the back of your yogurts, because it's the same bug that eats the sugar in yogurt and makes a little bit of acid, which turns the milk into yogurt and the same one that is living in the vagina, which by the way, when you are on an antibiotic and you want to improve your vaginal health, eat yogurt. So those are all of our barriers. So now let's talk about how the flu would get to and through them. So 
the flu is mostly carried around in little droplets, which land on these things. So it would land in any of these spots. That's why it doesn't get through the skin particularly easily. It lands in those areas with little droplets. Then it will, could possibly find its way through and begin to infect. It's not likely to be hanging around the air for too long. You can pick it up from surfaces as well, which is why, especially right now, we're telling people to wash their hands a lot because you pick things up from surfaces. And then if you put your hands in any of these openings, that's where all those little viruses will go. All right, so let's say that the virus makes it into the body, past the barriers, past the mucous membranes. Now what's going to happen? Well, it's going to find its way into your bloodstream and you have a whole bunch of immune cells whose job it is, is to go after these things. When we discussed the cardiovascular system, we discussed that your different white blood cells have different jobs, so you'll see different ones in each case. There are some things that very much like to go after viruses. Natural killer cells are one of the cells that tends to go after viruses. We also have some chemical defenses that kill viruses. So some of your cells produce interferon and they produce complement, both of which are chemicals that get in the way of or mess with viral structure. So they can all go after viruses. Your body may also try to use heat as an induction to kill viruses, which could cause a fever. All of these are innate defenses that happen almost no matter which kind of bug gets into your body, or in this case, no matter which kind of virus gets into your body. So those are all things that can happen to help you kill viruses. And if you don't have too many, it'll go ahead and kill them right away. And you probably never even noticed if you have a whole bunch of viruses, then these cells are going to try to do their best, but the viruses may replicate faster than they can get there. All right, so now we're going to switch gears from a virus to a bacteria. And in this case, the bacteria I want to think about would be something like salmonella. So salmonella is a bacteria that is pretty commonly found in chicken products, raw chicken products, and maybe some other things. And in this case, to get this kind of bug, you can't just touch it. It can't just land on your mucous membranes. It has to actually find its way to a place where it can grow and infect because it is a bacteria and it's going to grow and infect in your digestive system which means you absolutely have to ingestion ingest the bug before you can get it it can still move on hands to your mouth and then you could swallow it but it's probably not going to get into your eyes and ears and nose and things like that now if your body detects something that's foreign in this area quickly it will try to expel it which is why you typically know you got some kind of food poisoning if the first thing you're, that happens is your stomach attempts to reject it by way of vomiting. So expelling is an acceptable way for your immune system to remove things. It can do it through vomit. And if it makes it all the way into the intestines and then it starts to replicate, another known method of expelling would be diarrhea, spit out everything in the intestines. The same thing is true for things that happen in the urinary system. So urination or frequent urination is a common thing if you have some kind of bug invading the urinary system, which is why when you have a urinary tract infection, you feel like you got to pee all the time because your body is constantly trying to expel the bug. So those are some other ways your immune system says, hey, get rid of this thing. And that's why a lot of these come along with various different kinds of illnesses. And it's sometimes hard to tell which ones are which because anything that doesn't belong, your body says, nope, nope, get that out of there. All right, let's continue talking about bacteria and how your immune system kills bacteria. It tends to do so using various white blood cells. So let's have a little bacteria. So here's my little salmonella. Salmonella has uh, lots of little like cilia and flagella on it. So that's how you know it's a little bacteria. And your body will send white blood cells against it. And in this case, the white blood cell that prefers to eat bacteria, you might remember from the previous cardiovascular stuff is called a neutrophil. And so this is, for example, a great big squishy neutrophil. They're kind of big squishy cells that move around. And the neutrophil is going to want to eat 
the little bacteria. In general, any cell that wants to eat another cell is also called a phagocyte, phago meaning each site meaning cell, and the process of eating that cell is phagocytosis. So this neutrophil is going to use phagocytosis to eat this little bacteria. So how does it do that? Well, it does it in parts. So one of the first things that it does is it detects the antigens on the outside edge of the bacteria and it comes towards it. The cell membrane of the neutrophil is going to try to go all the way around and grab this little cell. So the next step will be, and I'm going to erase this neutrophil and then draw it again so you can see it, would be for the neutrophil to wrap itself around the bacteria and try to pull it in. And then as it keeps doing that, it will eventually pick up that little bacteria completely and have it entirely engulfed thump, inside of a vesicle. So the first thing it does is it picks it up in a vesicle. And if you recall, picking up something in a vesicle is called endocytosis. So now the bacteria is inside the vesicle. And the next thing that it's going to do is it wants to destroy it. Huh, do we have something that lives inside of cells in vesicles that is for destroying other things? Of course we do. We have lysosomes with their lysozyme and their digestive enzymes. And so the lysosome is gonna go over to whoop, this cell and it is going to try to spit its digestive enzymes into here to break down the bacteria. So the lysosome merges with the vesicle and it breaks it down. So that's the next thing. Lysosome adds digestive enzymes and then the bacteria is broken down. All right. So now I need to move some things again. So now instead of having a bacteria inside of this cell, what we have instead is a vesicle containing the remains in small pieces of said bacteria and no more living bacteria, which is good. But we still don't want all of that stuff. So the last thing that has to happen is that that little vesicle is going to go to the edge of the cell and it's going to spit out the remaining materials. So let me redraw our neutrophil. Only this time, the little vesicle is at the edge and it is spitting out all the little pieces and letting them go. Hey, do we have a word for when things are spit out and released from a vesicle? We do. It is exocytosis, which is the last step of phagocytosis. So phagocytosis starts with endocytosis, picks the bacteria up in a vesicle, destroys it with enzymes from the lysosome, and then releases all the leftover pieces with exocytosis. And that is how your white blood cells kill the various things in your body. All right, so going back to some more things that happen with the immune system and innate immunity is that your body responds to pretty much everything that doesn't belong with the same generalized reaction. So what would you do if there was something wrong in the body? Well, if I found something wrong, I might want to send a whole bunch of useful stuff to that area, which is what you do. And how do we send stuff around the body? We do it through circulation. So we're going to increase circulation to where Ever the parts of the body that are being infected are. The process of doing that is vasodilation, meaning we increase the size and the rate of the blood vessels in that area. Vasodilation causes the process called inflammation, which you are probably at least somewhat familiar with. Now think about what happens if you send a bunch of blood to an area. Well, first of all, if you're sending a whole bunch of fluid to one spot, that area is probably going to get swollen. 
if you're sending a whole bunch of blood, it's probably going to get warm, so it increases heat. It's probably going to get red. And if you're pushing against all the different things and encountering a lot of cell damage as we try to fix things, it's going to produce pain. So swelling, heat, redness, and pain are all of the major signs of inflammation. And if you want to try to remember those, a few semesters ago, a student of mine pointed out that those letters are redness, heat, pain, swelling, RHPS, or Rocky Horror Picture Show. So if you want to remember inflammation by doing the time warp, that is totally allowed. All right, and all of that, again, is caused by bringing blood to the area. So the whole point of inflammation is to help. You want to bring immune cells to wherever the problem is. But then, because you're bringing all the immune cells, you're bringing a whole bunch of extra blood, you're bringing all these things that causes the swelling, heat, redness, and pain. So inflammation is actually a body response. It's produced because of something that doesn't belong there, but it is your body's response to it. And so most of the symptoms that come along with various types of pathogens are actually your body's response to these things. Sometimes your body responds to other stuff this way. So for instance, if you get a splinter, it is an object that still doesn't belong in your body. Your body calls it a foreign invader. Or if, for instance, some pollen gets into your body, sometimes your body will think that's a foreign invader. So how does it actually know what to do with that? when it's foreign and to bring something along? Well, that's because of these fancy things called mast cells. Mast cells are stationed throughout the body and it is pretty much their job to say, hey, who are you and do you belong? If it encounters something it doesn't belong, it produces a substance called histamine. You might be familiar with histamine if you take antihistamines because your body is producing histamines against every silly little thing that tries to enter you, like, for instance, pollen or dust or who knows what else. And then the histamine is what tells the body, hey, bring all the stuff here. It starts the inflammation reaction, which causes all of these things, which is why everything is so annoying when you have some kind of allergy or some kind of simple infection. All of those happen. In terms of an allergy, you're probably familiar with this. Things swell up, they get warm, they can hurt, you can get welts if it's on the outside. It can cause, um, and sometimes it even causes itching with some of these things. In terms of something like a cold, you can also find all of these. So colds are caused by rhinoviruses in most cases. And a rhinovirus is so named because rhino, for nose, this virus likes to live in the cells in your nose or upper respiratory system. All right, so the virus gets into your system. It wants to replicate in the cells inside your nose and your throat in some of those upper areas. So it starts to do that. The mast cells discover it and they say, oh no, and produce histamine, which brings inflammation. So all the stuff in that area starts to inflame, which brings the very, uh, the, the symptoms that you're used to, for example, a sore throat, your throat swells up and becomes inflamed. Also a stuffy nose, because the stuffy nose is actually caused by the inflammation of the little blood vessels inside of your nose. So that's an important thing. Your body then also will overproduce mucus to try to flush the thing out with its barriers. So you end up with a lot of mucus and these large blood vessels in your nose, and it makes your nose feel like it's really full of stuff. It's really not that full of stuff. It's mostly just the swelling of the blood vessels. Your throat can get very sore with the swelling as well and can also get mucus in it. And then, and this is actually my favorite symptom of a common cold, all that mucus needs somewhere to go. So the mucus starts to slip down your throat. When it slips down your throat, it can be very irritating, especially if your throat has been swollen and has some damaged cells in it. So what happens is it irritates your throat and you cough. Interestingly enough, you don't usually cough that much at the beginning of a cold because your body is still ramping up all of this production while it's trying to kill the bug. 
but your body is pretty well known for overdoing things with its immune system. And so therefore, even when the rhinovirus is dead or in very, very small amounts, it will keep on producing extra mucus just to make sure and keep on dumping it down your throat, which will keep on being irritated, which will cause you to keep coughing. For most cold viruses, usually by the time people are coughing, they're not transmitting the virus anymore. That's not true of every virus, obviously, but for most rhinoviruses, it is because at that point, your body's immune system has already done its job and the little bugger is mostly gone. So what do I do when I get a cold? Uh, I try to stop the whole reaction because I know that the cold virus isn't going to injure my cells too badly and my body's pretty good at fighting it. So rather than let my body go crazy fighting it, I will take some antihistamines and anti-inflammatories and try to keep all of those symptoms a little bit lower, but also try to kill off the virus. So one of the things that I do is I take things that are known to help kill rhinoviruses. For instance, zinc has actual good scientific evidence against that. Uh, so does garlic and onion and ginger. So I will eat all of those things to try to kill the virus while trying to keep some of this inflammation down. And if you have a really stuffed nose and it's really bothering you, you really want to bring down the inflammation or inflammatory response. That's also why when you have a stuffed nose due to allergies, a lot of times people have little nose sprays that contain steroids. Steroids are anti-inflammatories. What they're trying to do is tell your immune system, hey, hey, maybe don't inflame so much. It's just some pollen. And the steroids will tell the body to chill out or at least to vasoconstrict, which will bring down the inflammation and make it so that you can breathe again. Now, obviously, all of this depends on where the viruses are interacting. So some other viruses interact in different places. Flu viruses do get into the respiratory system a little bit, but it's not necessarily their favorite place. They like to get into the bloodstream as well and kind of go throughout and start affecting you, which is why you get full body responses like fevers and aches and pains. And our fancy new uh, novel coronavirus causing COVID, SARS-CoV-2, it does infect the body, but in this case, it's mostly aiming for cells that are in the lungs. So the cells in your lungs contain the receptors for them. And then the same kind of immune system inflammation reaction happens and the lung cells get swollen. They can get destroyed because you want to kill cells that have virus in them and all those little immune cells are around there trying to kill things. And they throw lots of holes into those spots in your lungs and your lungs are really skinny. They don't have a lot of cells. And so they can start to leak fluid, which is how people end up with pneumonia. So a lot of that is still the immune system response, but you're always balancing an immune system response. You want your immune system to do its job, which is to kill the virus, but you want it to not go overboard and try to kill you at the same time. So when you're fighting a virus, you are playing a game of who's faster and better at the job. In some cases, the viruses can replicate in the cells faster than the immune system can kill them. In some cases, the immune system ramps up so fast that it's killing the virus, but it also takes out a lot of your cells. That sometimes happens with a fever. Your, the goal is to create a high enough temperature to kill a virus but not so high that it kills human cells. So 101, 102 degrees, you're probably taking down the virus. If you can stand it, you can stick with it. But once you start getting to 103 and 104, then you're probably doing damage to your cells and you're going to start being in trouble if you keep that up. So those are all things to consider when talking about the immune system. So I'm gonna talk about just one more aspect of immunity that comes with a very specific thing. And in this case, it would be fungi, and I'm going to specify candida. So let me remove this stuff and talk about yeast infections. Yeast infections are caused by a fungi called candida. And candida is kind of an interesting little bug. And actually, there's a bunch of infections that work this way because you can actually find it on surfaces, and not just any surfaces, sometimes on your skin. Candida on the skin is not that big a deal. It's there in pretty small amounts, and it probably is always living there. 
And in fact, you can find yeasts in the air all around you. That's how people make sourdough bread. They collect the yeast in the air into the flour. So what's happening here? This is a bug that should be fine, but now it's causing an infection. Well, there's a lot of bugs that live on the outside of you or in small amounts that should not be in large amounts or on the inside of you. So if the candida finds its way into the mucous membrane of the vagina or the throat, then it says, hey, this is nicer, warmer, and has a lot more liquid than I'm used to. I should replicate here, and it causes an infection. That's one of the main reasons that the vagina has bacteria that produce acid, because it keeps the fungi out. Acid keeps out fungi. Fungi definitely don't like acid. It's also why having good bacteria living on and inside of you is important, because those good bacteria are actually part of your immune system. They help keep out some of these other guys. So you're most likely to get a yeast infection when either your immunity is low or if you take an antibiotic that has killed off a whole bunch of your bacteria. Same thing can happen inside the intestines. You have good bacteria living in the intestines that are supposed to be there. And if they get killed off, then bad guys, for example, C. diff, can come jumping in and saying, oh, I have space to live now and take over. So you want to feed your good bacteria and not let the bad guys jump in. All right, that is all I have to say about innate immunity for now. Talk about specific immunity another time.